I bootstrapped it with my own money and now it's mushroomed into something that can generate hundreds of millions of dollars with and probably even more than that. This is Jay Peters, an entrepreneur who founded several multi-million dollar businesses that has allowed him to create a real estate empire while also creating one of the largest inventory donation services in Africa. I'm sitting down with him today at his compound in Tanzania, Africa, after visiting him to learn more about his gold mining operations that he's building out. And I want to learn how he went from living under a bridge at one point. I don't care to have a big fancy house. I've been there, done that. It didn't do anything for my life to make my life better. To creating business after business that would produce cash generating machines. Okay, so I'm sitting here with Jay Peters. Uh, we got introduced through a blockchain project that I've talked about on the channel before. And yeah, I've been been with spending time with you now for about 24 hours. And just getting to know you has been really cool. Um, I've gotten a lot of insight. So Asked you to do this interview. Uh, thanks a lot for sitting down with me. You bet. Go ahead and introduce yourself. My name is Jay Peters. I am from the Midwest. I uh, call St. Louis, Missouri my home. I've been there for 38 years, working odd jobs, like working on the wheat harvest, working on oil rigs. I worked on a ship a little bit. So a lot of different things. And then to make a long story short, I very quickly started a, a business career. I started a little company that has now morphed into a national company and at, at a very young age I, I was able to have a lot of success that led me into buying and selling companies and then um, starting some other companies you've done so much that you know some people like many many people are going to accomplish in their lifetime and i want to backtrack and ask you about when did you make your first million so how old were you what was that business venture like and what were some things that you took away to now get you to where you are to where you can fund hundreds okay. of millions yeah. of dollars? Yeah, yeah. I was a kid from middle um, America and um, I didn't have any real strong financial training. I had a father that was very entrepreneurial and I think some of that, you know, leached onto me over time. And so I got into a mindset of doing things that were risky and after a period of time, um, I began to see risk as normal, you know? And so I learned even through my childhood, through things that I went through that there's very little traffic in the extra mile. If you're willing to go where nobody else goes, if you're willing to do hard things, you can get incredible results. So I started a little business out of college and, you know, I made my first million by, you know, my mid twenties. Okay. And, um, you know, that uh, I started that little business. And after my first year in business, I literally wanted to quit. I, I'd made twenty nine hundred dollars working my butt off. And um, while I was in college, I worked for um, Chick-fil-A and it was kind of when they were a younger company. And so I worked for the founder of the company. His name is Truett Cathy. And uh, we opened mall stores back in those days. It was all um uh, they were all situated in malls, not standalone stores. When well, you know, I did mall openings with him and, you know, I'd done chicken for, you know, several years and or a couple of years and, and Truett wanted me to come into corporate and, and, and kind of move forward. He thought I'd be perfect for that. But I'm like, Truett, I, I just, I think there's something different for me, something, bi you know, bigger. I don't know what it is, but you know, I just don't see myself doing that. So after about a year of being in business, I was discouraged. I called a friend of mine in Chicago that he, the, a college buddy that he'd gotten on with a commercial um, real estate company. He made 30,000 bucks. This is 1985. And I thought he had made a king's ransom. I, I couldn't even fathom that kind of money. Okay. Because my little business, I made $2,900 after, you know, it's a startup, but I'm doing it with no money. And you know, bootstrapping the whole thing. And uh, so I called Truett up and I said, Truett, I'm ready to quit. I, I just, it's just hard. And everybody's there. There's too much competition. Everybody's cheaper than me. And so I, I, I think I'm going to quit. Maybe I'll go into the corporate world. And, you know, I was actually looking for direction. He said, stop. Okay. You know, the secret of Chick-fil-A, you know it. He said, if you take my secret and you put it into your business, he said, I can guarantee you're going to be successful. And so I thought about it for a minute and I thought, yeah, I do know the secret of Chick-fil-A, at least in the early days. 
And um, I knew what made people buy chicken. And what was the secret? So the secret was they would take those nuggets, put them on a plate, put a toothpick in them, and they'd send a kid out into the mall and they let people sample what it tasted like. And about eight, back in the stores I worked, 80% of the people that would sample it literally would come up and buy something. So what Truett was trying to teach me was do what I did. Maybe it looks a little different, but do what I did. So I began to go to big commercial accounts. I, I had a service business. It was cleaning and restoration. It was a business that was really in its infancy. Um, and there was no real structured, uh, uh, you know, way about it. And so I um, decided that I would implement what he's doing. So I go to all these management companies. And so I realized if I was a problem solver, that a lot of people would want me. And so I, to, I, I tell them, hey, I don't want to take your, your vendor that you got now. I said, what I'd like to do for you is number one, be your backup guy. If your vendor can't get there, let me be your backup guy, but also give me some work that he can't do, that he can't complete, or he doesn't, he just thinks that he can't fix it. Let me take care of it. Let me show you what I can do. And so I began doing that. I began doing a lot of sample free work. I mean, weeks and weeks and months and months of free work, along with a little bit of pain. And I'm starving to death, mind you. I'm in a one bedroom house in a little town called Arnold, Missouri. Um, part of the house had a dirt floor. I was newly married and I was even embarrassed that I lived in this house. It was a one bedroom house. So I turned my little bedroom into a call center. The call center was me. And then it was eventually my wife. We began doing telemarketing out of that bedroom. We sold our bed. We slept on the couch. Okay. So that we could have a little office room. And so that's where it kind of started, uh, started a mushroom, but then I was also working all these commercial accounts and little by little, I just did better work than anybody else. I just killed it. I just did. I figured ways to fix problems that nobody else was fixing. But then I also put together a, a bundle of services so that now these management companies, they don't need to call five or 10 companies. They can call me one call and get all these things fixed. Okay. Well, that began to spread like wildfire. Management companies told other management companies, managers began to talk and all of a sudden, boy, the work started rolling in. So the next year, you know, I ended up making in gross, in, in, in kind of a net profit about a hundred grand. And then it grew from there every year. And then it went to 250 and 500 and it just kept doubling to the point where I, you know, was making like, Nobody was making the kind of money that I was making, even executives at Chick-fil-A back then. They weren't making this kind of money. I, you know, I'd stumbled across something pretty early on in that career. I had a guy call me and he said, hey, do you have that, that vacuum sucking machine? And I'd actually cleaned his carpet for him a few months earlier. I said, yeah, I do. He said, well, my basement flooded, my carpet's all wet. Can you bring that over and suck that out? And so... I said, yeah. So, so I drove over there in my little tiny Dodge Ram minivan that I'd had all lettered up. I unloaded my machine and I sucked that water out of there. And it was the tail wagging the dog. I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never done this before, but I also knew that it could possibly be billed to insurance. And I didn't know anything about that either. And so over a, about an eight hour span over, over several days, I sucked it out. I dried it. I pulled the pad out and then I went back and I relayed the pad. I dried it on my, on my uh, patio and then took it back, put it in. I reinstalled the carpet. I cleaned it and uh, I had no idea how to bill it. I had no idea. There was no pricing structure for it, but I found out that his insurance company would pay for it. So I put together a bill, just kind of winged it. I'm like, okay, this would probably cost 10 or 12,000 to rip everything out and replace it. I'm guessing, I don't know. So I'm going to charge you $3,000. So I put together a bill, said $3,000, uh, a water damage uh, cleanup. I sent the bill in two weeks later, I had a check in my mailbox for 3000 bucks. Okay. I've got eight hours of work. Okay. So this is in the eighties, this is big money. Okay. So uh, I looked at that check and I'm like, I can do this the rest of my life. <laughs> okay. This is crazy money. So I'm still just a little young guy. I'm not even a father yet at this point. I don't, I don't even have kids I'm about to. And so I began to pursue that kind of work 
also with these management companies and that began to grow and to the point where I've got six trucks, I've got 10 trucks, I've got 20 trucks, you know, begin to just mushroom into this thing that I had never anticipated. And so it got to a point when I was 27, you know, I, I was thankful for what I had and we were using a lot of that money for missions projects and different things. And I had also afforded me a lifestyle, you know, I built a, you know, I, because I didn't have a lot of background with money management or anything, I built a multi-million dollar home by the time I was 30, you know, and, uh, you know, bought millions of dollars in ground. I started buying commercial buildings and, and things like this, and it began to mushroom. And then I started, I got a little bored and I started buying bankrupt companies. And, and, and the idea was to fix them, sell them, I, you know, because in my naive brain, I thought, well, if I can run this company, I can fix, it's just business. I can fix any company. Fortunately, God protected me through a lot of that, a lot of mistakes and a lot of learning that allowed me to move on to other things and, 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 and make a fair amount of money doing that. And then that allowed me to get into the real estate business and, you know, to buy significant amounts of real estate, especially in downturns. It became kind of a niche thing that I was doing. And so all along during those, that 30 year span of growing, I was doing these mission projects and I just fell in love with Africa. And every time I leave, I was trying to figure out how can I get back? You know, when can I get back? What can we do good to change the lives of people? And so, you know, between using my own money and, and you know, I had a few friends jump on board to help with it too. Uh, we created this not-for-profit and so the not-for-profit got really big we were you know running thousands of square feet of warehouse space that we were taking in overstock product for major corporations that we use in microfinance like i said before that dried up in 2020 and then that opened the door you know we were doing food at that point and so that opened a lot of doors even with the government here in tanzania to start a farming project that would be funded by a gold mining project okay they're all tied together and none of them, I do have investors that have come along the way and they'll get paid handsomely and they'll do very well with this. And I'm very happy. Most of them are my buddies, right? Or close friends. I started this with millions of dollars of my own money before I would take anybody else's money because I had to make sure it's safe. And then, you know, I had my friends come in and we raised millions of dollars through my friends. I don't have a piece of paper with any of them. They just handed me checks like, just make it happen do it we believe in what you're doing to change the lives for these people i bootstrapped it with my own money and now it's mushroomed into something that we literally can generate hundreds of millions of dollars with and probably even more than that and that's mind-blowing um but i'm more excited about the farming the humanitarian side because that's where my my soul just wants to be so um we're not there yet, but we're getting close. So we're meeting with the government about, we've got a 33,000 acre track that we've identified. It sits uh, alongside the largest lake on the continent, Lake Victoria. Like it's like the size of, just smaller than Lake Superior. So it's a big boy. Uh, and we can irrigate all of this land so we can grow rice, corn, and beans. It will be the largest farming humanitarian project the earth has ever seen. And if I die on a tractor, I'm going to die a happy guy. That, that's all I want to do. That's amazing. I mean, the, the fact that you're, you know, that you're so, you have, you even you, you mentioned it too, that you were earlier on. It's not like you became a billionaire. Then you're like, oh, wait, how can I give back now? It was even earlier on your, your first business that you made the million on your, you know, you were, yeah, you, yeah. And in, so I, I can tell that that's really an important, that's important to you. So as a younger guy, you know, I was driven, money driven. I wanted to build something. And in my early life, I thought if I have money, I have security. And what I learned over time is this is not true. You know, I, and I, I ended up meeting a lot of rich people and working with them that they may have had more problems than people that didn't have money, right? So I learned that, you know, that security does not come through money. And, you know, money is a tool to, to use. And, and, and for me, I believe it's, it's a thing that God um, shared with me to be a steward of, not to, to, 
to live like a king, but to be a steward of. Yeah, I built a big house when I was a kid, and I look back and I look at back at the immature mistakes that I made, but I matured over time, and I sold that. I used even part of that money for ministry stuff to help people, but he allowed me to mass enough that we can get this whole project up and running, and now it's 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 got a life of its own. You know, I don't really want to run this. I, you know, I've got other people that God's brought into my life. They're going to help run it. Young guys, you know, I'll be 60 in a few weeks and, you know, I don't have the steam that I once had. Boy, I still got the drive and I've still got the passion. Yeah. That's an amazing story. And I, and I want to touch on too, you have a very unique perspective because you've been in the States, you've been in Tanzania for, you know, a, a while you can touch on how long, but you mentioned, and you said to, to me and a couple of the other guys, how there's different ways to make money over here. There's so many different ways to make money. Yeah. And you were just spitting them off. You're like, I know this guy who did this. Or like, if you can do this, and I want you to touch on some of that. And then also maybe why you think that is. But can you, because there are a lot of money, ways to make money in the state. Yeah. But yeah. you were just saying, I just want you to kind of get into that. Yeah. When I got to Africa years ago, I realized there's a tremendous opportunity here. There's just no capital to do, to launch projects with. And, you know, unfortunately, the West sees Africa as very, very dangerous and very scammy. And, you know, like the Nigerian scams, you hear about all that stuff and people get ripped off. And so they don't want to come here. You know, they that, that's just their opinion. And what they don't realize is the United States is like, I mean, Africa is like Europe. You have different cultures all over the place and they function very differently. And yes, there are some countries that have significant problems. And you, 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 you could be hurt, damaged, ripped off. All of these things can happen. But for some reason, God put me here in this country of Tanzania. And it's like the safest place on earth. I mean, no one will harm you here. And especially if you're a foreigner. And what they've done here is it's really, it sounds kind of harsh, but it ended up being really beautiful. They have incredibly harsh punishments for crime. And so what, over time, you know, people see people get punished, they realize the crime is not worth it. I'm not gonna steal, okay? You know, and you know, we started running a gold buying office in a little city called Musoma, and there are days we'd have to run down the street to the bank and get bricks of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars to take down to our office, which is located in the tax center. And I was very nervous about that. Like, we need security, and, and my Tanzanian uh, partners were like, what are you talking about? Nobody will take your money here. They'll be executed for that, okay? Nobody will take your money. And it took me a long time. It took me many months to get comfortable that I was shipping money in here. And I would even ship because you can't really set up a bank account right away. I To get things going, I would ship hundreds of thousands of dollars into locals' accounts of my money, okay? That should make anybody nervous. But every one of them performed and did exactly what they said they would do. None of them tried to keep the money, right? They could have. They could have lived like a king the rest of their life on that money. But they helped me use it to do the business setup so we could get the business set up and then get the business accounts where we could wire the money in. It's an easy place to do business. There's a little bit of red tape, but there is in any country. There is in the U.S., okay? There, there's a lot of regulation here, but it's not like more developed nations. It's just easier to navigate here to get stuff done, you know, and the opportunities here are just off the hook. You know, like the plastic chairs we're sitting in, you have to be really careful because they're made in China, they're very cheap, they're very wobbly, okay? The legs can crack off very easily. You know, if somebody had come here with a just a one injection molding machine and make plastic chairs with thicker legs, everybody would buy it, you'd sell millions a year. You know, it's just silly stuff like that. You know, you can grow coffee here. Um, you know, I'm in the gold mining sector. You know, the gold mining sector, there are so many, many, many different ways that you can make money. Yeah, so that's my caretaker coming right. through and landscaper. All right. uh, there's so many ways to make money in gold here from, from the bottom to the top. You know, one of the ways you can make money with gold is helping the little miner. They are busting rock by hand. It's, it's laborious, it's dangerous. So you can help them speed things up by buying a, a, a jack leg drill that they can drill in and they, they can bust massively more uh, rock than they could have doing it by hand, like a thousand times more rock that they can process and they can make more money 
and then like a, an investor would do a profit share with them. And how much are one of these drills? Ah, they, you know, it depends on what you buy. You buy Chinese, they're three grand. You buy a quality one out of the States, they're five to 10, you know? And so them here, that's a lot of money, a significant it's a, amount. Of it's money. a lot of money, but when people get producing in the gold world, it's not a lot of money. Yep. They're willing to spend 10 grand yep. to get the best of the best if they can get it because it's going to last, whereas the Chinese, you know, piece of junk is going to last three, four, five months, and you got to rebuild it, repair it, if you can even get parts. The blessing is that you get to help these little guys progress in their life, you know, and, and then even help them do things in a safer manner and more responsible. So, you know, but then it gets down to brokering gold. Everybody's buying gold. Mostly it's brokered by the Indians here. They make the majority of the money and the Chinese. And so they go to the little guy that's risked his life and, you know, gold sells it, you know, what's 62, $63 a gram right now. Well, they go into the field and they're able to buy the gold for 10 or $20 a gram, sometimes even less than that. Okay. From a little guy that's from a team of guys, they've risked a life to get that gram on that given day, it's really unfair, okay? So then that guy sells it to another guy that sells it to another guy, there's a food chain, and then it finally gets it to the big guy, which is typically an Indian or an Arab, that they're, they're flying in with hundreds of millions of dollars, or tens of millions of dollars, and they're buying this gold up, and then they're making the majority of the money doing little to no work, right? Which is very, very unfair. We can actually help the little guy take his gold all the way to the end marketplace. And now their their families can thrive. Cut out all the middlemen that are doing nothing for the people here. They take the money and they run and they do almost nothing for the people. They don't build hospitals. They don't build schools. They don't, you know, do feeding programs. They just want to take the money and go. And on top of that, the majority of gold that leaves this country, no taxes ever paid on it. The, the government told me 88% they believe leaves the country untaxed, but they know Working with me, I, I'm going to pay the tax, okay? It's only 7%. But, you know, if you're generating enough gold, it brings a lot of money into the government to help the people. But the double whammy is we'll sell that gold. Yeah, we'll make money with it. But we're going to bring that money right back here, and we're going to do all these programs. And so that's the space I live in. That's what I'm the most excited about. I want to touch on how, like, you, you talked about buying in low times. So I, how... You're, you made, you told me uh, you, that you make the most money in the down markets. But then, and then the, I also want to touch on too, and if this ties in or not, but with networking too. Like some people are just like, I got a network, I got a network. You told me that you don't even join these groups yet. You have one of, like, you have a very impressive network of people. And so, can you kind of touch on those two things? How, you know, buying at the bottom of markets and what that mindset is? Yeah. Everybody's doing that. I've always found a lot of opportunity in, in down times. When, when the economy is not doing bad, you know, most people are trying to bail out. They're trying to get out of things. I'm trying to get in it because when they're trying to get out, there's opportunity and you can buy like property land cheap. Okay. And so, um, in 2008, I bought a building, okay, the, everything looked bleak, okay, all these houses are being repossessed, and, you know, you're, you're the, the Fed is on TV talking about, you know, we're working on this and trying to solve it. Well, during that period of time, I uh, was active at a sport called skeet, where you use a gun and shoot these clay birds, just a fun afternoon sport and um i was um put on a team with a guy that was president of a major corporation but he was also on he was a member of the the board of the federal reserve and so him and the chairman of the federal reserve were talking every day and they were you know he was telling me kind of what's going on there he gave me a little a little bit of insight that was frightening okay just absolutely frightening that okay they don't they don't even know what they're doing. Okay. There's, he said, there's no playbook <laughs> for this. Sure. Yeah. Th yeah. And so, you know, I'm like, wow, this is, uh, this is going to get way worse before it's going to ever get better. And so I'd bought a building and then my wife got a little skeptical. It's like, yeah, if, if the, the economy is going to go off the cliff, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of deal you got. 
you know, it's no good. If you don't have anybody to fill that building up, it's just an albatross. So I thought about it and, you know, for, uh, I don't know, two, three, four weeks. And I thought, listen, I think this is worth taking a risk on. So I, I pitched a deal to banks. I said, listen, I'll do a deal with you, no money down, okay? You can lean the last building that I bought, all the equity that I got, because if I bought that from you, you've got an appraisal, you know I've got equity, okay? So let's use the equity in this. I am not gonna give you a personal guarantee, and you're gonna finance it at a really, really low rate. And I actually didn't think they would bite. I, I, I was kind of testing the waters. Well, one bank took that deal. So, you know, they're in trouble. They're upside down with the FDIC. The FDIC looks at their books every Friday, or I'm sorry, every Thursday night. And if you're upside down too long, you're on their watch list. They have the potential to seize you on a Friday night at 5 p.m. Well, when that happens, all your bank officials that have ownership in that bank, they're all, they all lost everything, right? So they're trying to save themselves. So... I get a call and you know, I started doing this, the word got out, bank after bank. Uh, a lot of times the bank presidents call me, hey Jay, how you doing? I don't know these guys. I, I might've met them at a charity event or something, but I knew why they're calling. And so they're trying to you know, preserve themselves, their job, their equity in the bank. And like, hey, I got a project I'd like for you to look at. Um, and so on, I would, I'd get that call on Monday and by Thursday we would close that deal. They'd have the appraisal, they'd have all the paperwork done. By Thursday afternoon, we closed that deal. We just did building after building like that. I mean, it was astounding at the rate at which we were doing this. It was, it was big money, okay? But you gotta remember, I got no skin in the game with money and I've got no personal guarantee. Why not do you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of this stuff? You know, now I look back and I think, man, I should have done five billion of it, you know, because I, I had nothing to lose and I'm saving them. Well, fortunately, the economy pulled out of the ditch. And my friend uh, that I shot skeet with said, we don't even know that, how that happened. We don't even know if it's anything the Fed did, right? We have no idea. And so um, fortunately it pulled out. We're able to plug people into these buildings at really low rent. And then over time we began to raise the rent. And so, and then we used the profits from those buildings for a few things. Um, number one, to pay the rest of our debt down, which was tens of millions of dollars. But um, we're also able to use a lot of that money, street, that money in ministry to help other people. Do you think 2022 was as bad as it's gonna get and we're on the way up? Because, you know, on my channel, everyone is always speculating that yeah. what's your what's your take on it from your you know I, up level? Uh, so uh, you know i'm a business guy i'm not an economist but i i follow a lot of very leading economists and just looking at where we're at today where we're at on the world stage you know we could be on the brink of war um you know we've got a a currency issue we have central bank issues there's a lot of fear okay and fear drives a lot of industries, right? You know, people manufacturing, you know, uh, uh, things for warfare, that, that goes way up. Uh, and many other industries, but others begin to do poorly. You know, our, our real estate industry is changing by the minute. I, I mean, it's changing at warp speed. Where you used to be getting multiple offers on a house, now that's kind of over in most areas. And now the prices are declining. And so I believe much more difficult times are coming, probably much more difficult than, you know, 08 through 010. But I also believe there's gonna be an incredible amount of opportunity for people um, that are prepared, that are preparing now for that opportunity. Whether it's, you know, taking money and setting aside, or assembling investors for when that comes along. I'm not interested in buying anything right now at all. But when the downturn happens, I'm interested in buying everything. Got to ask you this. If you were to lose everything you have now, but you were still interested in, you know, like someone who has nothing, basically, you were to start over from square one and you only had, let's say, $5,000 to your name, what would you do? Wow. Okay. <laughs> if I had 5000 in my name, I, so I just know this from, from experience, I'd take part of that money and I'd give it away. Wow. Okay. So 
already you, you're like i don't need i can start with less wow i don't i don't need much and then what would you do with the remaining 2500 so i would take it and turn it okay i'd figure out ways to turn it there's a lot of different ways to do it fortunately god's put me in the gold business i could take 2500 dollars and double it every week just get out in the fields get out yep, the gold fields I'd just get out there and scrap buying gold reselling it buying selling buying selling fortunately he's put me in the underground business where i can pull up hundreds of millions of dollars um but if if all that faded away i could rebuild it you know i i, I have the knowledge to do it but more than that i have the desire and i have the drive to do it because i know the end game i know what i can do with it i don't care to have a big fancy house i've been there done that it didn't do anything for my life to make my life better. So you've helped so many people, but you're currently helping so many people. What are you trying to do? You're still like, even the blockchain project that I got introduced to you through, it is a gateway to, for you to, uh, supply, to fix water supply yeah. in Africa right. and all these other things. Can you talk about that at all? Yeah. You know, so, you know, I vowed, I, I used to be in the business and run a charity that drilled water wells. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't know what I didn't know. You know, we would we had a, a, a funding mechanism where we got school children to collect millions and millions of pairs of used shoes, and we sold those on the on the 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 wholesale market, which most of that ended up in the third world. And we would use that money to drill water wells. What I didn't know at the time was I was probably doing more harm than I was doing good. And why, and why is that? Well, what I didn't realize was um, when you drill a water well, that's only half of the equation. Okay, yeah, you're doing a wonderful thing. You're giving people this clean water. But if you're not going to maintain that well, you're actually harming the people. Nobody thinks about the maintenance side and, and checking up and setting money aside so that you can buy seal kits and pump parts and all of this stuff. Here's the problem. If you're a villager in the middle of nowhere and you're drinking dirty water, Okay, you build tremendous gut bacteria that protects you. The moment I put you, I drill a well and I put you on clean water, your gut bacteria begins to drop. Okay, and now you're dependent on that clean water. When that well breaks and there's no parts to fix it, you go back on dirty water, you get dysentery and you die. Okay, it's a horrible way to go out. And so, you know, I, you know, God bless all the people that do these water wells. And there's a lot of response, responsible charities that are doing this work. But a great deal of the wells, the 50,000 that are broken here in East Africa were because they, they needed a, a, a hundred or $500 part. That's all they needed to, to, to take care of these people. So I vowed, I don't want to drill any more water wells. God bless everybody that's doing it. But I want to fix the 50,000 that are broken. I was the, one of the governors in Kenya, flew me by helicopter out to a remote area. He wanted to show me, you know, because they wanted help with the water wells. And so he took me to a well, literally in the middle of nowhere. It was a good well. It had a water tank. And so people were coming from every direction to get their water. Well, I saw a young mother. She probably was 16. She had a baby on her back and a baby on the front, all bundled up, strapped to her. And she had a five-gallon uh, jug of water, okay? And um, she would fill that water, put it on her head and walk. And so I, I stopped her and I said, where do you live? How far away? And she told me and the governor said, that's 10 miles from here. She makes that trip three times a week. So she, she's getting 15 gallons of water per week. That's what her family needs to survive. That's 60 miles a week walking. 60 miles a week with two babies on you. Okay. Think about doing that. I mean, the, this, this little girl was in good shape. I mean, she was strong. Uh, She's skinny as a rail, but you do what you have to do to survive. But this is what killed me. I found out that she had a water well in her village that had broken several years ago. It was there. It needed to be fixed for a few hundred bucks. So the, the, so the, the, the drilling part is the expensive part of making a water well. They can cost from ten to $40,000 probably the average one's probably in the 30s right to put the to drill it put the casing in well it's already there now the hard part is done the expensive part's done now it's just 
you know, small parts that keep the thing going. So the governments know where all the boreholes are. They've got GPS locations on everyone. They're easy to find. They know which ones are working. They know which ones are broken. So it's really easy to put together a maintenance division. We just go out and fix them one by one. You might be able to fix, one truck might be able to fix five or 10 a day. I, I don't know, you know, but yeah. it, it's typically just a seal kit. It's rubber that's worn out. You just need to swap that out. But we could also... While we're there, we can train the locals how to fix it. Maybe give them the few to few t tools that they need, and we can leave some extra seal kits. When it goes down, they can fix it in an hour. Okay? So, again, teaching them, it's a different way of teaching them to fish, but it can be done. We're building towards something. And, you know, the humanitarian side, the farming, the water wells, and many, many other projects, we've already got a hospital designed, ready to build, that we will use all the money we make to build these things. We're getting close, okay? You know, I've spent years of my life now trying to get to this point, and we're, we're there, okay? It's gonna take us time on the gold mining side. We'll start to churn a little money, then a little more money, and then a lot more money. I do have investors I have to pay back, and I have a handshake deal with the president that, that passed away that I'm gonna do these projects with the gold that comes out of this. What I have realized is the more money we can raise, the quicker we can do these projects, and the more expansive we can do them. The day's coming when I won't need anybody's money. I, I won't. And whether they lend it to me or whether they give it for the project, God bless them either way. You know, if they lend it, we'll pay it back, you know, you know, but the more money we, we can amass together, the quicker we can help people. Listen, we've had drought here, okay? The rice fields are dry and, you know, they depend on this. Kenya, just barely north of us, they're gonna have starvation, okay? You know, on any given year, typically, nine to 10 million people are in jeopardy of starvation over here. This is a problem that can be solved, okay? We have the food. The problem is governments and logistics. Those are the problems. We can move the food, we can manipulate it, we can grow it, okay? But it's governments that are the biggest part of the problem. Sealing the food, not letting it get where it needs to be, um, overinflating what they're doing when they're not actually doing what they're saying they're doing so the public doesn't help more, right? All of these things are going on and these problems are solvable. I just can't do it through government. I can't figure out a way to do it. So I, I'm so tired of trying to navigate through all the governments that I have to work through that I've just decided I'm gonna work under the table here, under the radar, and we're just gonna get it done. So if someone is watching and they, you know, they wanna look more into this or even uh, donate to the cause, where, like, what resources, where can they go for that? You yeah, so- The guy to talk to. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you a link to put in there. Okay, um, cool. You know, and like I said, we are certainly not begging for money here. You know, we believe God's gonna provide it one way or the other. And he's given us a tremendous vehicle to move forward with, but, um, you know, it stretched all of us to get here. The years we've been doing this, we're stretched. And, um, but we're also almost at the finish line. I got a lot of value out of the interview. So I can't even imagine, you know, I'm sure everyone else did too. And I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it very much. It's been really great getting to know you. You know, I can tell you're a solid guy and you're up to some really good stuff. I know you put out some really good con. I know, I know you're not going to put out content that is not quality or is not going to benefit people. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the relationship with Element. I thank you for the the relationship here. Um, I don't know where it goes. I, I don't. I don't. Yeah. But I'm curious to see. You know, I, I do believe in my faith that something big is going to come out of this, and there's going to be help. I mean, I'm not talking about monetary. You know, maybe people coming, donating their time, getting involved. I don't care, you know, but it, it, it you know, uh, it, it takes a village and I'm one cog in the wheel. And with a lot of really great people, we're going to do some really, really beautiful things. Yeah. Come check out Tanzania. It's been, uh, yeah, never would have imagined I would be going here. So <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, sir. I'll actually be going back to Tanzania in late September and Jay will be there as well. Check the description below to learn more about how you can attend this too.